Welcome to another edition of Canine Conversations. I'm your host, Robert Cabral. I'm sure you know that by now, and I'm glad you are here to share um, our passion of dogs with one another. I, um, I should have had this up last night, but I didn't because I, you know, now that you guys like this video format to the podcast, <laughs> excuse me, I need, um, I need enough light to do that. And the light is here now. And last night it wasn't, I don't have a really good light in this room. So, um, I'm kind of stuck with doing this when we can do it. But today I want to talk about something that's really uh, not funny. Um, it's very emotional. It's very deep. It's very moving. It's, it's a topic that's really dear to my heart. And it's a, I wrote this um, article a few years ago, and it's about grieving the loss of your pet. And um, you know, the one thing they say is grief is the flip side of love. And I remember um, a Catholic priest once saying that the, the deeper the grief um, the, the stronger the love was or the stronger the connection was. And I really agree with that. I think that's really an important aspect for us to look at when we, when we miss something or when we grieve something. And, um, you know, it, it's hard when you grieve for a dog or a cat or whatever the animal is because a lot of people don't understand that. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today is that that feeling that sometimes you can't share with somebody. It's really hard to um, to find somebody who understands it. Some people do. I mean, there's a lot of people who really understand it. But I've heard people say, well, you know, I lost my husband, son, wife, daughter, whatever it was. And you know, I would give a hundred dogs lives to, to have them back. And that's all fine. But you know, that's not true, right? Um, that's just being kind of indiscriminate about someone else's love for something. And I remember that when I lost my dog, some people were really compassionate, and they usually never say the right things, but I'm going to get into that in a little while. But um, people tend to oftentimes say the wrong things. So um, one thing is, you know, when you lose an animal, you know, you, 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 you see that very, very differently. Um, if you really love an animal, then you love that animal. It's very close to you. You know, a friend of mine once equated it to that, when you lose a dog or a cat or something like that, it's kind of like losing a child because you brought that child or that dog into this situation. So you, you don't know what it's like. It's younger than you. There's an old saying There's a Japanese calligrapher made um, these amazing, amazing poems and sayings. And a super wealthy person came to that person, came to the calligrapher Teshu, and said, I want you to paint me the most beautiful calligraphy and I'll pay you countless amounts of money for it, whatever it was. And the person, the calligrapher Teshu painted this calligraphy and handed it to him. And when the person got it, the person was completely upset. It was really angry about it. He said, this is the worst thing ever and I won't pay you for it. And Teshu said, what is it about it that upsets you? Read the poem to me, read the saying. And the poem said, grandfather dies, father dies, son dies. And Teshu said back to him, if I had written it in any other order, would it make more sense or would it be more, more uh, compassionate for you? And the answer to that is no. So we kind of do expect our grandfathers to die, our grandmothers, our, our parents to die, us to die, and then our children to die. Now, I have no children you know, to, to, to actually compare this to, but I, um, I will tell you that I was very sad when my father died. It was devastating, it was horrible. My dad was murdered a few years back, um, and it's something that I'll never recover from. Um, and, it's not but, and when my dog Silly died in my arms, it also really put an immense amount of uh, burden on me and, and sadness and stuff on me. So, you know, when Silly was a puppy, and I do this with all my dogs, when it's their, their, their birthday, um, I would every year I take their picture every year on their birth and you'll see that yesterday we took uh, Jimmy's picture and then uh, on the sixth it's Maya's birthday we'll take Maya's portrait and that's just a little tradition I have and what I used to do with Silly is I would take Silly to the pet store and any toy that his nose touched he would get now Goofy has so many toys he doesn't need that but um, that was our little tradition so um, again a lot of times people who grieve the loss of a pet or, or people who connect that deeply I should say with a pet are people that don't really um, fit into the world somewhat you know and I think I'm one of those people I'm kind of 
a little bit strange and stuff like that. I think I have different emotions. I mean, I find certain things very sad and certain things happy. Um, I, I connect very, very deeply to animals. I'm going to put this down a little bit here. Um, I can connect very, very deeply to animals. I love them. I have a lot of compassion for them. Um, and, uh, and that makes it really hard. So when I lost Silly, it was devastating to me. I remember the day that I took him to Dr. Lisa and she did a blood test on him and I was on my way somewhere else and she said, you've got to get this dog to, um, to the hospital because he, he has kidney failure. And it was a Sharpe. It was the most amazing dog I've ever known, I mean, besides Goofy and every other dog. But um, he, was, he was my everything. And they said, you know, he kept him there for a day or two. And they, couldn't, they couldn't do anything. It was Sharpe fever, was, you know, and kidney uh, renal failure. So they couldn't do anything to save him. So they said, you know, just take him home. And when the time comes, just humanely euthanize him. And it was, man, I mean, I got goosebumps now just telling you that story. It was so, so, so sad and so hard for me to hear that. And I took Silly home. And I can honestly tell you that, I mean, Goofy was with us. He never ate again on his own he never ate again i used to take food and put it in the food process and for 30 days i never left the house i did not leave the house unless i was going to get groceries or take silly or goofy for a walk i didn't work i didn't see friends i didn't go out i did nothing i just cared for silly every single day and i didn't know how long it was going to take I, you know went into my savings i wasn't training dogs i wasn't doing anything because i needed to be with him every single day and um i remember loving that knowing that those were our last days together i mean the blessing was and i remember somebody said once um there was a jewish belief that sickness became the way for us to say goodbye to people like my um my aunt just passed away recently and she was sick with cancer for six seven months and i went to florida every single month and visited her and hung out with her and talked to her and and bought her things and did all that and that was my way to say goodbye and that's kind of what i did with um with Silly is I said goodbye to him through those times, through those, you know, those experiences we had together. I remember I told him that I would carry him on the beach one day when he couldn't walk on the beach anymore. And I did. I carried him there all the time. We, we went for our walks and I carried him when he couldn't walk anymore. And uh, I have one picture of, of Silly that's a spectacular picture that just really resonates, you know, in every way that I loved him. But um, I think, you know, I mean, I started Bound Angels because I love animals so much. And it's because I see animals as little angels. I think they're little like emissaries from God that are sent down from heaven to touch our lives and to make our lives better. And I truly, truly, truly believe that. And if somebody doesn't believe in God, that's their perspective and that's their right. But I do I have a very, very strong belief in God. I have a very, very strong faith and, 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 and belief that, you know, what we give is, um, is what we're going to get. And giving something to an animal is really... I think the greatest compassion because that animal can't give anything back from you. So if you look at the, you know, the biblical story of the woman who gave two pennies into the collection box and the man who gave a million dollars and Jesus said that woman gave more, gets me all choked up. Um, that woman gave more because she didn't have two cents to give. And the person who gave a million dollars, which wasn't dollars, but that person had millions and millions of dollars. It meant it didn't mean as much. So, um, you know, the pain I, I, I felt from losing Silly and, and Boots before that, who was only with me for a couple of months, um, stayed with me. It stayed with me forever. I mean, the pain of losing my dog was a pain that I'll never get over, just like the pain of losing my dad or my aunt or, or you know, my grandmother or anything like that. But this dog was with me every day. That's, I think, what the difference is here. People don't understand how close people bond with their dogs or their cats or their pets. Right. That animal is with you. I mean, like you go around a corner and that animal is there. They're in your home. They bond so strongly with us that there's no way that can be compared to anything. Children go off, they go to school, they do this, they do that, they become independent. Animals never really become independent. They only become more dependent on us. Right. So when they're puppies, they're off, they're doing their thing. But as they get older and older, like right now, I mean, I can't show you because I can't move the camera. It's on my computer. But Goofy is laying right next to me, right right on the ground, right next to me on a cold, hard floor when he could be laying on his bed. But he chooses to be with me. And it's that. It's that connection that you can't share, right? You don't have. Here's the other thing. Because animals never speak, I think we form a deeper bond with them than with people who we speak to in, in many ways. I'm not saying in all ways, right? I mean, I've 
incredible compassion and love for my mother and Janet and, and you know, my, my, my sister and all that. But, um, but I think this connection you have with an animal that can't speak is so unique and so different that it makes it, um, it, makes it hard for you to live without it. It's almost impossible. Um, I'm looking at this article I wrote and I wanted to read some of the parts off to you. Um, you know, one of the common things that people often say to someone who's grieving the loss of a pet is, you know, don't worry, do the best you could, they're in a better place, there's the rainbow bridge, God doesn't open a door where he doesn't, uh, close, doesn't close the door where he doesn't open another one, and so on. And then there's the people who will undermine your suffering, right? They'll just say to you, you know, oh, well, it was a dog, you go, go get another dog. That was the key thing I, I just, oh, f it pissed me off so much. Just go get another dog, right? It's, well, just go get another husband or have another child or, you know, or adopt another person as a father or mother. I mean, that's, that's bull. You can't do that. It's not about just go get another dog. It's about that dog that died, right? And then some people said to me, well, you're such a great trainer. You do so much with rescue. This, will give, this opens your house to another opportunity to get another dog. And I didn't want to hear that, right? I didn't get another dog after Silly for years. I mean, I had Goofy, thank God. But nothing could compare to that. And that's the, 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 the important thing. And like I said, um, the, the fact that I really think what my friend told me years ago, comparing the loss of the dog to a child makes sense, right? A parent who loses a child will never, 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 I can't even imagine the sadness and pain and, and the turmoil that must go on in somebody's mind who's lost a child. How terrible and how devastating that must be, right? And there's no answer. There's nothing you can say about that. So, um, you know, it, 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 we know a dog is not a child, and I'm not comparing it to a child in any way, but I do say that there is, a, like a person who hasn't had a child, like, you know, Janet has a daughter, so she understands that um, there's a deeper love for her daughter than for her dog. I get it. But I don't have a child, right? I do not have someone that's that close to me. The only thing I have that close to me is, is my dogs. And for those of us who are in that position, you understand that, right? You really, really get that. Um, I, I, like I said, I stopped, I stopped everything I did when Silly got sick because I knew he was going to die. I knew that. And you know, the funny thing is, I know Goofy's going to die and Maya's going to die and Boz and Jimmy and Dwayne. I know everybody's going to die. So, you know, the key thing in that is how do you live your life, right? So you have to live it to its fullest. You have to live it with passion every single day and know that eventually your dog will die. And when they die, you're going to be devastated. You're going to be heartbroken. You're going to be ripped into pieces. And those people who don't understand this, people who are listening now saying, well, it's just a dog. I mean, when my dog dies, I'll get another dog. And I know plenty of people like that. And they're not bad people, right? I'm not saying they're evil for not having that ability to connect at that level. That's just not who they are. But this podcast is for those people who are like I am, who, who can't deal, who can't fathom the thought of their dog being dead. And, you know, when Silly died, I, I, I'll still remember, I still remember to this day, you know, my friend Kim and Joel and Kim's mom at that time, who has, has since passed away too, I called, I texted all my friends. He died at like two in the morning. I texted everybody. And Kim said, um, I'll be there in the morning and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll be there with you. And Joel couldn't make it. Joel's a great friend of mine too. He couldn't make it. But, um, I remember that before Silly died, I knew he was going to die. So I went down, as I know it sounds morbid, but this is my process. I'm going to share my process with you. Um, I went down to a, 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 a cabinet maker and I had a, a coffin made for him. I measured him and I had a coffin made while he was alive. It's terrible just to even talk, talk about this, thinking about this. Um, and I went to the pet cemetery and I picked out a plot for him and he was there with me when we did it. And we walked up to it and I cried my eyes out. It's so hard to talk about that. Um, knowing that that's where he would be buried. So anyway, the day he died, I called the cemetery and I said, please open the plot. You know, I'm going to bury my dog today. And they did. They were amazing, amazing people. And, um, and then Kim came by with her mom and, you know, we took Silly. I, carried, I held Silly in my arms in the back. You know, I tell you, when he died, when he, he had three uh, seizures and then he died, and I just held him in my arms and Goofy was laying behind me. And um, I cried and cried and cried and cried. Oh, man, I cried because I just loved him so much. I mean, I just I couldn't couldn't imagine him not being there. So um, anyway, uh, I cried so much that he was his head was soaking. He was dead, but he was soaking wet. So I dried him off. I washed him off. I blew dry him. I 
brushed them and everything. And then I um, got in back of Kim's car and we drove him to the cemetery and I buried him there. And, you know, my friends were all there with me. All my close friends were there. So um, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever gone through is holding him in my arms until he died. And I remember I, there's this book by Esther Jungreis. It was a great book uh, on Judaica, and it was called The Committed Life. It doesn't matter all this stuff when I talk about God. I don't care if you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, um, Buddhist. I don't care what your religion is. I, I don't care. And, and you have a right to believe as you believe, and I have a right to believe as I believe. So I'm just sharing these stories as good stories with you. I'm not proselytizing or anything like that because I don't care. Um, but this book called The Committed Life, and in the book, um, someone comments to her, how amazing her father was and how he helped this person, you know, help them grieve through the loss of one of the toughest losses they've ever experienced. And Esther asked, how, what did my father, hang on, says, um, what did my father do that was so profound? And the person said, he said nothing, he just cried with me. And that is a lesson that changed my life. It taught me how to grieve and how to share grief with others, right? So when people try to make it okay. Like they try to justify it. They try to tell you that, oh, this is just, you know, it's part of life. It's a cycle of life. It's, it's this. You're going to see him at the Rainbow Bridge and da, da 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 That's not the right answer, right? If somebody is grieving, and I've, 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 I've put this into place so many times, um, when my friends have lost their pets or loved ones, and to console them, you know, um, I always lean on that lesson, that lesson from Esther Jungreis, and it is, and I just will sit there and say nothing, Whatever they say, I'll repeat back to them, right? And I will just let them cry. And I'll cry with them if I feel so compelled and I feel that passion. You know, there's an old saying that when you cry with someone, you lessen their burden. You lessen their burden by crying with them. But by trying to make it okay and consoling them, you're only making it worse, right? It's, it's just, there's so many analogies I can give, but I don't even want to deviate from this topic. But... There's so many analogies on people who just tend to um, try to make that go away. Don't, right? When I'm grieving, let me grieve. Let me grieve and grieve and grieve until there's no more grief, and then I can move forward. And that's really what it's like when you, when you do this, when you, when you lose a pet. Allowing people to grieve is profound. Trying to shut that down is really inhumane. Right. In other words, sometimes people can't handle grief around them, so they try to shut down the person who's grieving. But if you're really strong, then you're going to grieve with that person. You're going to share. You're going to take a part of that grief off of them. And you need to do that. So if you lose a pet and you're devastated, you need to open up to a friend. You need to open up to a friend and you say, I just need to cry. And this is the same thing with depression. You know, for somebody who's who's dealt with it. I can tell you, if I'm down, I'm depressed, I'm sad, then let me be down, depressed, and sad until I get through it. You know, don't try to fix it. Don't try to say, well, you have an amazing life. I know I have an amazing life, but there's times when sadness kind of overwhelms us. So, um, you know, how long the experience of sadness or loss lasts, no one knows. It took me a month to just be able to, like, function again after silly. So that was two months, a month, taking, a month taking care of him while he was sick, and then a month of grieving afterwards. So, and that's, you know, it, it's, it's so profound while you're in it that nothing else matters. Nothing matters. And I, I, you know, I was very blessed. I had a little savings account I was able to dip into to pay my rent and to do these things because I wasn't working and my business came back afterwards, even though I was very disrespectful to my business and stuff. But, um, you know, when you're in it, it's just this spiral. And I remember my friend Kevin said to me, um, who's lost several dogs and totally understands it, you know, he said the day he died, the, the day still he died, that was the bottom. That's as low as it gets. And it wasn't actually that lower, you know, when he took his last breath and I put him in the ground and I buried him, that was the lowest it got. That was when it was over. It was done. His suffering was over. And I knew I'd never see him again you know, at least in this life. I mean, I'd like to believe that there's a heaven or there's, you know, that we were, we're souls and our souls go back into the universe and heaven or what, however, whatever that concept is, whatever God has in, in store for us, um, I believe that everything we love will once again unite with us and everything that we hate will disappear and go into a different place. Um, but 
you know, like I said to you, I, I felt like an outsider my whole life. I, you know, I was, I was young. I got beat up a lot. I studied karate. I, I started studying Eastern religion, Eastern philosophies. Um, I never felt like I belonged. I never felt like I was attractive or strong enough or good enough for anything like that. And all those things really pushed me into my relationships with, with animals, my friendships, my bond, my ability to communicate with animals because of that, right? Because I didn't feel like I belonged with people. I mean, I, yeah, I had friends and stuff like that. But I'm saying inside, at your core, you either feel like you're super strong and super good looking and super successful in this, or you don't. And I'm one of those who didn't. So, um, you know, it, it, it was because of that connection, I think the pain was more profound. The, the, the pain was deeper. So, um, you know, when I see people grieving the loss of an animal, I'm super compassionate to it, right? I never, ever, ever want to be the person who says, oh, it's going to be fine. Oh, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to love again or this or that. Just sadness is something that, in my opinion, just needs to stew, right? It just needs to be there. I remember a friend of mine said, well, just go out and do all your favorite things on that day when you're sad. Well, the problem was all my favorite things were gone when Silly died. That was it. Silly was gone. Thank God I had Goofy, you know, which is why sometimes I recommend people to getting a second dog near the end of the first dog's life because two reasons. One, um, it does give a new little life to, you know, I mean, like Goofy coming in. I mean, I, I, I'll someday put up some videos to see how Goofy and Silly played. I mean, until their, till Go Silly's last day, Goofy would play with them. And I remember, you know, when Silly would be laying in his bed, uh, you know, when he was dying a few days before he died, Goofy would come running up all happy, playful, jumping, pouncing, and he'd go right in front of the bed and then he would just stop because he sensed it. He could sense how Silly couldn't take it, right? Silly couldn't handle that. And that's one of the, one of the things where dogs, because of their energy, will will stop, right? And they'll get that. They'll understand that. And through the body language of, of Silly not doing anything, um, Goofy stopped. And, you know, because of the way Silly played with Goofy, Silly lives on in Goofy. I mean, he just does. I mean, and, you know, when I met Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy is just like Silly was. I mean, he has the same playing and the same barking and the same pouncing and the same super sweet, sweet, sweet kindness about him that Silly had. They both have that. They're, I've never met another dog like Jimmy um, who exemplifies what Silly was. I mean, it's just, it's, it's sometimes just makes me want to cry because it's that, that kind of a connection. So, um, so again, you know, if you're grieving the loss of your dog or your cat or your bird or, you know, your hamster or whatever it was, um, you know, remember, first of all, dogs, I'm just kind of segue a second. Dogs really bond with us in ways that no other animal does. Not chimpanzees, not cats, not birds, nothing. There's no connection like the, the connection between a man and a dog or a human being, I should say, and a dog. Um, so when if you have that connection and if you can really feel it, like if your dog is just a dog and whatever and you, you, know, you don't care, oh, my dog got away and whatever, whatever. Um, my dad was more like that, right? My dad was not very deep at connecting and maybe that's why I connect so deeply because it's, it was very different. My dad connect, connect with people. I mean, obviously he loved his kids and his mom and all that, but he wasn't that close. It, it wasn't as important to him to connect with a dog. Um, but if you can connect like that, or you do, and, and if you do, you can't help it, right? I mean, my buddy Drew is so connected to his dog. My buddy Mike, super connected to his dog. Uh, Kevin, you know, I mean, these people are so deeply enmeshed in the lives of their dogs and in the connection with their dogs that they they don't know another way and these are tough guys right these aren't some pansy wimpy kind of guys these are tough guys like me who who cry when their dogs die and i cry when my dogs die i tell you right now i'm a complete basket case and when that happens let me let me be sad right and if you're sad because your dog died then be sad man cry cry, wail, tear your clothes. I mean, take out every picture of your dog. Look at every movie on your phone of that of the dog and how much you loved him and talk about it, write about it, uh, share it. I mean, do it. And, you know, that's your process. Your process is about being sad and about going through sadness, not about avoiding it. Sadness is, is in my opinion, sadness is a friend that's best not avoided right? It's your friend. It's your memory. It's your compassion. It's your remembrance of that dog that, that lets you 
it, it lets you feel that sadness. Like to, that's a powerful thing to be able to be super sad or super down or whatever. That's an emotion. And it's not an emotion that should be downplayed. And that's what I think people tend to do. People say, and I think they do it because they're not comfortable with it, right? Just like um, certain people, like I remember, like my mom, you know, she's still with, with us, thank God. But um, she was never really comfortable with a lot of emotions. So like sadness, super sadness, couldn't deal with it. And like, um, the, like super happiness, like if you were just giddy, laughing, cracking, she couldn't handle it. So there are people like that. And again, they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just not like me, right? Um, and, and there's a lot of people who aren't just like me in the world, and we have to share our life with them. So the important aspect is that you don't have to be like somebody else. You should be like you. And if you deal with sadness really deeply, like I do, then that's just what you have to do. And don't let anybody shut it down. And if you're one of those people who doesn't feel compassion or, or emotion that deeply, that's okay. But don't try to shut down somebody else's emotion. That's the critical thing that I want to kind of get through in this grieving the loss of your pet is if you're grieving, grieve, man. Grieve as hard as you can and do whatever you need to do and stay in that process as long as you need to stay in it, knowing that that's fair, right? That's your final tribute to your dog or your animal that you lost. And you can put it onto whatever. If it's a person, that's fine. I'm just talking about dogs here. Um, but, you know, the idea of grief being dismissible is very, very paralyzing to me. It's very saddening to me. I don't want to get rid of it. I want to go through it. And I think if you just kind of avoid it, it's going to creep back. No matter what, I, by the way, you know, I mean, since I lost my do dog, Silly, I mean, I've had Maya and Goofy and I've known so many other dogs and everything. And I've never thought that, you know, that would replace it. In fact, I know for a fact, Goofy never replaced Silly, right? Maya never replaced Silly. In fact, no dog will ever replace Silly. And when that God forsaken day comes, when I lose Goofy and Maya or whoever comes first, I will be devastatingly sad. I will be overcome with sadness and pain and anguish and everything, and I will go through it. And if you're going through it, if you've gone through it and you don't know how to go through it and you don't know how to deal with it, let me tell you, there's no right lessons, right? There's no books or, or podcasts or anything that's going to tell you how you should do it. The only answer is you got to do it the way you got to do it. And you got to embrace that. You got to cherish it. You got to hold it close to you and you've got to embrace it and know that that's yours. And when that animal passed away, in my f core, core, core belief, and again, I'm not really religious, I'm spiritual, I do believe in God, I have a, a great faith. I do believe that everything we love is an energy, and I believe that that energy comes back to us. I don't believe it ever really leaves us, right? I think that the love I've shared with Silly or Boots or, you know, the love I'm sharing with, with Maya and Goofy, as, as well as obviously the love of, you know, my, my fiance Janet and, and, and my mom and all that, I think that's a part of us. I think those, it's the energy that makes that. So physically, when we leave our bodies, I think then that energy reconnect. So that's kind of like the hope that I hang on to is knowing or thinking or believing and, and belief is a very, very strong thing um, is believing that that connection, you know, we will come back to it. You know, I've lost several animals through my life. The most powerful one obviously was silly because he was with me for uh, eight years. And uh, the 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 hardest thing I think to ever talk about is that pain. So I hope that my having shared my pain with you can give you some kind of a semblance of logic of how somebody like me deals with it. And I'm in the shelter all the time. I see a lot of death. I see a lot of, I mean, I held my dad's hand till he died. I've held several people until they died. Um, and I've seen life pass away from people and from animals. So I've been there with several animals who have passed away. I've been there with several people who have passed away. And I think it was a cathartic, super powerful experience. Um, that changed my life. But I hope my sharing this with you um, gives you a little insight onto that it's, it's okay to grieve. You know, it's, it's cool to be sad. It's cool to go through sadness and pain and suffering and come out the other side and be okay. But you're not unaffected, right? Because you come through the other side, you come through it with that lesson of sadness, with that lesson of grief, with that lesson of, 
of compassion and understanding for other people that when they go through it, you can be there for them. And that is the most important thing, that if you're dealing with somebody who has experienced a loss or is experiencing a loss, the way you deal with it, the way you handle it, is what shows compassion. And the way to show compassion is to let people be sad and share the sadness with them, thereby removing a little bit of that burden from them. So I'm going to wrap that up on this podcast. I'm on my way out the door. i got a big uh, weekend ahead of me here. I'll share that with you guys next week. And um, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to check out my um, my YouTube channel, my membership section on robertcabral.com. Um, of course, I uh, hope you like this podcast. I hope you give it a great uh, five stars. And uh, I'll see you soon. Take care. <laughs>